By way of introduction, I want to, you to watch a very short video of something that is really cool. I think you'll really like it, but it, we're going to talk about it as soon as the video ends. So sit back for about two minutes and watch this little video. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I want to begin this morning by making a very honest, emphatic statement. I am not a prude, okay? I love to have as much fun as the next guy, but there's a limit to what I believe is a wise use of time and resources. What you just watched is a video of a snow castle, but I want to tell you about it. It's in Finland where it's cold all the time. But they decided, this community, that they would build a snow castle every year. And for the last 20 years, they've built a snow castle. Now, it has 13-foot-high 13 13 high walls that run 1,650 feet around the perimeter of this snow castle. It has hotel rooms. It has a restaurant. It has a chapel where you can rent it to have baptisms and weddings. It has a theater that will seat 3,000 people. And they have operas and recitals and concerts and stuff in this snow theater. It's constructed completely out of ice and snow. 30 men spend about three months building it every year at the cost of $1.1 million a year. And then every April, it melts away and disappears. I say that to you because this morning... The Apostle John in our text is telling us not to love the things of this world because the things of this world are temporary. And I think the image of so much effort, I mean, $22 million in the last 20 years, being put, put into something and then watching it simply melt away and disappear is a good example of how we can put our focus on the wrong things. John is talking to us and lays out for us how we are to live in our relationship with God. He tells us in our text, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If, the, 
if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that's of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Do you remember last week, if you were here, John was calling us to understand what God's will is for our lives. He says, my dear children, I pray that you do not sin. And they went on to expound how we are to carry out that great commandment, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. But then John heightens it, reminding us that Jesus said that we're to love our neighbor as he loves our neighbor, that we're to love people in a way that is better than loving ourselves. John wants us to understand what it means to live as God's children in this world. Now, it's one thing to say that we love God, that we love our neighbor, that we want to live according to the will of God. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it on a day-to-day basis. And that's where John comes in today, talking about the struggles we have and how we can live as God's people. He starts by identifying how temptation comes against us and what draws us away from God. He said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And all we have to do is go back to the beginning to see how those are used against us. Poor Mama Eve in the garden. There with Daddy Adam. The tempter comes in. And what, what happens? It says, the woman saw the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and desired to make one wise. And she took the fruit and ate it. She saw all that was promised. Now think of who Adam and Eve were. They walked with God. They talked with God. They knew God in an intimate relationship. And yet in that moment of temptation, their focus was taken off of God and onto what was falsely promised to them. And when they took of the fruit and ate, they lost everything. I would put forth to you that every avenue of temptation, every type of temptation, no matter what it is, comes to you out of one of these three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or pride of life, and many times all three combined, like we see with Adam and Eve in the garden. And what John is calling us to is that in light of this world and the challenges we face, we have to make a choice. We have to determine in our hearts to love God first. It's a decision we have to make, a choice for our lives. Now, I would assume most of us would agree that weddings are kind of fun, and they're beautiful and wonderful to see a young couple enraptured in joy and excitement. And we expect when a couple stands up here with a preacher and pledges their love for each other, that they're taking those vows to heart. The vows reflect that. We're going to forsake all others. And we want that to be a decision of the heart. But what happens if it's not? What happens if they simply mouth the words, but it wasn't a a decision, a conviction of their hearts? Then over time, things happen, circumstances change. He or she gets a wondering eye and looks beyond that relationship as something they deem would be better. Temptation comes And all I have to do is look out in our world and see the evidence of broken marriages to realize that there are many people who don't take the choice, the decision, seriously. Think about God. In eternity, he had a choice to make, a decision. Would he love us fully and completely or not? And he made his choice. He made a decision, a commitment of his heart to love us even more than himself. He chose to love us. He chose to send Jesus to save us. And get this, he even chose to put up with us. Because how many times has God remained faithful to us when we have wavered and faltered in our commitment to him and fallen and failed and sinned? And yet, As many times as we fail, God's commitment has never wavered because he made a choice, a decision of his heart to love us regardless. And what John is trying to tell us in our text is how we can make this kind of choice, commitment, decision in our lives to love God first. 
He first tells us, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the God is not in him. Well, he gives a simple statement. To love the world means you don't love God. But the opposite is true too. When you love God, the things of this world pale in comparison. The question is, how do we learn? How do we come to the point where we have absolute fidelity, love that consumes us for God, that then fortifies us against what comes to us from this world? It takes first understanding the depth of God's love for you. Do you, do you understand? Sometimes I think we talk about it so much we fail to realize the depth of what God did. That when we were unworthy, when we were sinful and separated from him, he chose to come to us, searching, seeking us. We were guilty. We had a discussion in Bible class about people in jail and getting what they deserve, contrasted with forgiveness. Do you realize what we deserved? Jail, punishment, eternity, separation, all that stuff. And yet, God sent his son into the world to do what? To take our guilt upon himself, our punishment upon himself, our judgment upon himself, and die on a cross so we could be set free. We're like little orphans wandering around with no place to belong, no one to care for us, dirty little faces with no ability to help ourselves. And what does God do? He comes to us and says, I want you. I'm going to adopt you into my family and you're going to become a child of God and part of a family bigger than you could have ever imagined. And you're going to live in the midst of my love in all that you do. And there has never been a point in our life when we have, from the time faith is born, that God has not been with us. Loving us, providing for us, guiding and directing us, forgiving us when we fail and encouraging us to do what's right. We, when we understand the depth of God's love, then we can begin to understand what it means to live as God's people in this world. The problem is so many people don't do it. Some people don't make a choice. I mean, one of the greatest tra tra tragedies of this modern era of, of Christianity in the world is so many Christians live and act and think just like the world. In other words, they, they do the things the world does and not what Jesus would have us do. There have been those who've tried to escape the world because it was too hard. You know, ascetics, monks, you know, hermits. They, they, they thought the only way they could live for God was to separate themselves from the world and live separate. There was a guy once named Simon. They called him the stylite. He actually erected a pillar that was 30 feet high, put a platform on top of it, got up on top of the platform and lived on top of that platform for the last 37 years of his life till he died. He would preach to people who came to him, but he separated himself from the world. But is that what John means? John wants us to understand that when we know God's love and what and the commitment he has for us, that we can begin to love God first and foremost in our lives. And I think you would also agree with me that any loving relationship must be nurtured, must be maintained. And whether it's a boyfriend or girlfriend, a husband or wife, extended family members, you nurture those relationships, don't you? And you should, or they're going to falter. How do we nurture our relationship with God? How do we grow stronger and fortified against the temptations that will come? I think it has to do with looking at Jesus. And like Sarah told the kids, what would Jesus do fits in this sermon very well. Because when Jesus was tempted, it was in every way just like us without sin. And think about it. If I go a day without eating, I'm hungry. I want to eat. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness fasting when the devil came to him and tempted him. Jesus, you're hungry, turn the stones into bread. Then he took him to the pinnacle, the, to, to the mountaintops to show him all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give all this to you if you worship me. So he lust the flesh, lust the eyes. Then took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, Jesus, jump. Show everyone you're the, you're the son of God. 
pride of life. How did Jesus deal with those temptations? Because we're going to face temptations in the same areas. Lust of the flesh. We hear the word lust and we usually think sexual sins. And it's true. Every sexual sin is born out of lust. There's no doubt about that. But lust itself is a craving or a desire that moves us to want something to please our fleshly nature. So understand there's nothing wrong with wanting to eat. There's nothing wrong with wanting companionship. There's nothing wrong with wanting sex or, or protection and security when they're used within the context of how God prescribed them. But when we set God aside and want what we want because we want it, it usually moves us to sin to get what we want in a way that God doesn't want to give it to us. So lust of the flesh moves us to crave what we want to please ourselves in a very fleshly way. Jesus was hungry. What's wrong with turning a stone into bread? And yet, he knew it was a temptation to deny his confidence and trust in his Father. So he spoke back to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That temptation was over. It took him to the top of the mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. All these I'll give to you. Isn't that what the world does to us? Buy this bigger house and you'll be happy. You've been married a long time, not looking the same or Get this young woman or this handsome man to be your spouse and you'll be satisfied. Get this better job making more money and more, more prestige and you'll have all your desires met. But all you have to do is look at the lives of the rich and famous and find out that what the world has to offer never really satisfies, does it? How did Jesus deal with the temptation to be given all that you could ever dream of in this life? He spoke back God's word. Okay? He took him to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the first two temptations, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, deal with what we want by nature. Flesh, flesh the desires. Lust the eyes has to do with coveting and greed. What others have that you want. But pride of life is different. Pride of life is exalting yourself because of what you do have. Trying to set yourself up and make yourself better or more important than others in the eyes of those around you. We call it arrogance, being prideful, those kind of words. And it was the hardest temptation Jesus faced. He was standing there above all the temple courtyard where all the people are at. Jesus standing on the pinnacle, the pinnacle of the temple. Satan said, prove you're the son of God. What's the problem with that? He is the Son of God. What's wrong with him revealing who he is? And yet, what did Jesus say? You should not put the Lord your God to the test. What is the common denominator in all three temptations against Jesus? I want you to understand, I want you to hear this. Jesus did not rely on his own strength to stand against temptation. He could have, but he was living a life in our place for us, showing us how to live. He did not rely on his own strength in the midst of temptation. He turned to the word of God and stood upon God's promises, God's word for him and for you to stand against the temptations that would come. We, as God's people today, first have to make a choice to love God first above all else and then take God's word in our hands and understand it is a tool and a weapon to stand against everything that would come against us if you're being tempted with a sexual sin go to God's word and look it up and you don't have to have a bible anymore get on your phone put temptations to sin or lust and you'll get countless bible passages shot back to you instantly where God is talking about our hearts and our fidelity of love for him and for our spouse and for our family. Even Solomon said, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. First, use God's word to fortify yourself to stand against the temptation. And then, be in fellowship with other Christians. Jesus chose 12 to be with him. He was never alone beyond that time of temptation. 
He fellowshiped with others. We need that. We need people we can be honest with, who will hold us accountable, who know us well enough to say, I know you've been struggling this area of your life. How are you doing? Can I help you? Can I pray for you? Make yourself accountable to brothers and sisters in Christ, and honestly, this should be with husbands and wives first, to be honest and open with each other. And then get involved in ministry. When you are involved loving others, you don't have a whole lot of time to focus on yourself. And that's how you combat the pride of life. That when you realize that you are a servant and you're not all that special yourself, but God has put you here to love others, when your focus is there, it's off yourself and God is using you in great ways. John wants us to understand that we're going to face temptation. It's not a matter of when, if, it's a matter of when. We're all going to face temptations. We have a choice to make. A decision. Choose to love God first over and against the things of this world. And then nurture that love and prepare yourself for life as a child of God in this world. And stand against the temptations that come. And as you do that, there's one thing for sure I can promise you. When you learn how to love God and prepare yourself and nurture that love for life in this world, you will Hear me? You will experience the victory of God. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.